Uh, so again, we all know, uh, have an idea, have a definition in our mind of what the word you know, good means. Um, but goodness, um, it's really, it, it's a state of being in, in something or in someone. It's, it's, it's found in the, the nature of something. And you, you, know, you can say, well, you know, that food was really good or that book was good or, boy, that, that's just been a good day, you know, things like that. So it, it's really just, it's, it's within, it, it's, it, it's in the, the nature and the character of, of something. People, uh, when we see goodness in people, we only know that it exists because it has to be demonstrated. So an act is seen as good, but that good act comes because of what is within the nature of the person. We say that someone is good by, by what they do, otherwise, otherwise their, their goodness is, is hidden to us. They could be a good person, but we only know it because it's, it's demonstrated. It's being kindly disposed toward other people. It's a demonstration of, of our goodness. It's, it's how we perceive other people, how we treat them. It's not seeking something for myself. So when goodness is displayed, it's because of, of a concern for someone else, even maybe to um, the denial of something for me. But even further than just not doing things bad, but, but being good toward others, goodness is proactive. It takes upon itself um, to, 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 to be displayed. Goodness is, is motivated by, by a concern for others or for other things and without thinking primarily of me. We don't have evil intent whenever we are good. We're, we're, we're always working for what would be the best in a given situation to the benefit and the profit of everyone who would be affected by anything that I do. So we know that there is goodness. We see it in, in a number of things, but particularly we want to think about, uh, about beings, about, about people, and today particularly about God. And so, you know, we would say, you know, we think of a particular person and say, boy, that, you know, he or she is a, is a good person. And that may be generally true, but, but still with people, our goodness varies. It can be greater or lesser, depending on our circumstances, but depending on who we're dealing with. With a human, goodness is not always a guarantee. It's, it's not an absolute. It exists within a person, generally speaking, but it fluctuates. We're not always good. We can do evil as well as good. And even sometimes our good could be motivated by self-seeking purposes, by ulterior motives. So we do good, but, but what is at the, the, uh, you know, the, the root of that? Our goodness is a derived goodness. Within man, there is no goodness except that which has been given to us by God. All goodness proceeds from him. We are not just intrinsically, inherently good in all ways. So this is one of those attributes of God that's communicable. We share it with God. Now, all, you know, we can share, we, we have knowledge, but we don't have all knowledge. And, 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 and there are various things that we have love, but we don't have the kind of love God has. But God does share certain attributes with us. We're made in his image. Therefore, we can be good but it's a derived goodness because all goodness ultimately proceeds solely from God. He is the source of all goodness. And in fact, you know, the word good is a derivative of the German word for God, or I'm sorry, God is a derivative of the word good. And so really just the word itself is an expression of, of this attribute of God, that he is good. So true goodness, pure goodness, is only found in God because only God is good, and he cannot be otherwise. He does not vary as the human does because God is immutable. That means he is unchangeable. He cannot change. Every attribute of God is absolutely perfect and is unchanging. He is eternal, 
in all of his attributes. So he is eternal in his goodness. He's always been good. He always will be good. That's all God can be. He's infinite in his goodness. There is no limit to how good God can be. God doesn't have to think about being good. He doesn't have to make a decision based on a circumstance or a person. Am I going to act in a good way toward that person? Because God is always good. It's his essence, his nature. He is good. So when we look back at what he told Moses at the burning bush when he said, I am, it's the completeness, the fullness of everything God is. He just is. It cannot be altered. It cannot be changed it cannot be lessened it cannot be increased listen to what thomas manton had to say about this he was a a puritan writer say god is originally good he's good of himself which nothing else is for all creatures are good only by participation and communication from god he is essentially good not only good but goodness itself The creature's good is a superadded quality, but in God, it is his essence. He is infinitely good. The creature's good, ours, is but a drop. But in God, there is an infinite ocean or gathering together of good. He is eternally and immutably good, for he cannot be less good than he is, as there can be no addition made to him, so no subtraction from him you can't change it god just is good it doesn't matter in any way that we look at him any thought about him any expression of that whatever it may be god has to be good the scriptures testify it to it throughout well one of the ways that we know god is good and just to the enjoyment and The benefit of all people is, as we even talked about this a couple of weeks ago, talking about the wisdom of God, is is how we see his goodness in creation. Not only for the provision and existence of man, but for the enjoyment of man, how good he is. And we talk about just the world around us, you know, the day and the night, the light and the darkness, the heat and the cold, the four seasons, the food that, that we have to eat, the air that we have to breathe, the 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 rain that comes down. I mean Everything is supplied for man to survive and for man to enjoy enjoy the life that he has. We just see God's goodness all around us if we just stop and consider all that there is. The man, human, has physical and mental capabilities then that make, give us the ability to take the things that God has provided and, and use them, whether it be, again, Planting a garden, growing our food, having flocks, and you know, you're looking at, at ancient man and how they how they survived in, in an agricultural world, how we have our jobs today, how we have we are able to use all that God has given us along with what He has put within us to survive. He is good in all the things that He has made. And He doesn't just give us like simple subsistence, just enough. I mean, every one of us really has an abundance. We have more than we need. We, we can enjoy. We get to make choices every day. What do we want to eat today? What am I going to wear today? Where am I going to go? How am I going to spend my money? Well, we have such an abundance. Even though we don't have, you know, we're not millionaires, but, but we still have such a supply. All of that is from the goodness of God. Psalm 145 says, The eyes of all look to you and you give them their food in due time you open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing he's talking about man he's talking about animal god's provision his goodness talked about that in job when he was talking job you know and saying where were you when i did all these things and look at how every animal is supplied every need is met i'm the one that did that and that's all out of god's goodness he gives food to all flesh psalm 136 says for his loving kindness is everlasting, and that the earth is full of his loving kind of the loving kindness of the Lord. Again, it's all, it's everybody, it's full, it's 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 extensive. Zechariah 9 says, How great is his goodness, the level that it goes to. Again, it's not just a paltry amount. His goodness is great, and the riches of his goodness, Romans 2 speaks of. That the wealth that God has, there is no limit, there is no bottom to 
the riches that God has. Psalm 52 says that the goodness of God endures continually. It will never end. That's the way he is, and he will always provide. He is always continually good. And we look in Matthew 6 where it talks about clothing the lilies of the field and feeding the birds of the air, that God even cares for the plant and animal life. Certainly, he says, then I'm going to care for you. God provides for everything. And Psalm 104 sums it up by saying they all wait for you to give them their food in due season. You give to them, they gather it up, you open your hand, they are satisfied with good. So just thinking of God's goodness in what we have, what we enjoy uh, on a daily basis, those common things, those things that everybody has, those are still expressions of God's kindness, his goodness, things that are both for our necessity and for our pleasure. I mean, think about the way the body works. For instance, we could just take the body and look at, 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 at the marvel that it is, whether it be the physical aspect, you know, how it functions, how it moves, how we're built to be able to do all the things that we do, how, how we, we, we can become expert with, with things of, of our hands and, 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 and can have creative skills. I mean, the body is an amazing thing. And, and the body can enjoy a lot of all of what God has made. We can enjoy it intellectually. We think about what our intellects can do and, and, and how it provides and how, how creative again we can be, how, how we can interact with other people, that our communication skills, what the mind can create in, in the way of, you know, whether it be the arts or the sciences or technologies and just, just how good God has, is in what he allows us to be able to do with both the mind and the body. But, even a, a more striking thing to me is, is just think about the senses, the five senses. I mean, for one, the senses are there for our protection. I mean, they guard us, they, they protect us as we, you know, as we see, as we hear, as we touch, stay away from things. I mean, our senses are there for a practical purpose, but also think about the enjoyment you get from the senses, the sights that we're able to take in, the beauty that we see. The sounds that we hear, be it the birds in the trees, be it a symphony, whatever, the ocean crashing. I mean, all the ways that we enjoy being able to hear, being able to see. Think about taste. I mean, what would it be like? God could have given us food. He could have said, here's your need. Fulfill your need, but you're not going to enjoy it. It's just you just have to eat it because you need to survive. But we get to enjoy it, which becomes a problem for us, doesn't it? Because we like something too much, and then we overindulge in things. But just the goodness of God to let us enjoy through the senses of the body, through the mind, all the things that he has made. Psalm 45 again, the Lord is good to all and his mercies are over all his works. At the end of creation, what did God say? And it was very good. Again, going back to what Manton said. God is eternally and immutably good, for he cannot be less good than he is, as there can be no addition made to him, so no subtraction from him. All of creation testifies to the goodness of God. And yet he gives us all of that despite our rebellion and our rejection of him and his law. In spite of that, God spared man. He provided for man, immediately clothing Adam and Eve, for instance. He provided for their needs. He said, you're going to have what you need to work the ground, to grow the food. You're going to have children, but all of those come with the curse. They do come because there is a punishment involved, but I'm still providing. I'm not throwing you out. I'm not annihilating you right now. I'm going to allow you to live. We didn't get the punishment that we deserve. We still have life. We still have enjoyment. We still have provision. And God is good to all people, be they believer or unbeliever. It doesn't matter. God has provided for everyone. And again, the enjoyments of life, being able to, to marry, to have children, to have an education, to have jobs, to have accomplishment and promotions, to, to be involved in all kinds of activities, leisure time things, hobbies, travel, uh, to enjoy, um, you know, th things like, you know, going fishing, going hunting, taking trips, whatever it might be. 
God has allowed that for everyone to be a part of, in spite, even if our rejection, even the atheist, even the hater of God gets to enjoy the benefits that God has provided to all mankind. And as Jesus said in Matthew 5, he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on both the righteous and the unrighteous. God is just good to mankind. Acts 14 just, just is glaring in, in this statement of God's goodness to all when it says, in the generations gone by, he permitted all the nations to go their own ways. And yet, he did not leave himself without a witness in that he did good and gave you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. In spite of our rejection of God, look at what he has provided. In fact, to the extent that if you go to Psalm 73, one of my favorites, Asaph is writing this psalm, and he's looking at the lives of the wicked, and he sees how good they are. He talks about them being fat, meaning they have everything, every type of food they could want. They, they can overindulge. They, they have everything. They have, they have pleasure. They have money. And he said even in their death, they seem to die peacefully. They, they, it's like, you know, why am I restricting myself, following the laws of God, when God's goodness is demonstrated to even the wicked, why am I restricting myself? It almost, the goodness of God, in other words, almost turned him to say, I'll just pursue the natural course of life. Why should I dedicate myself to God? Well, until he went into the sanctuary of God and he came face to face with the reality, where does all this end up? And he came to a realization, he knows that even if this life is the most wonderful life you could ever have, you still die without God and you're under his judgment forever. He came to his senses, but yet the goodness of God was so attractive because everyone, everyone is a beneficiary of it. So sadly, God's goodness is often just taken for granted because it's just there. And often, God is actually even accused of not being good because of catastrophes, because of tragedies. I mean, how many times... Have you heard a statement such as, well, if God is so good, then why fill in the blank? Well, if God were a loving God, he wouldn't fill in the blank. God is accused of not being good, and yet every one of us enjoys the goodness of God on a daily basis. That's why we live and breathe and exist, and yet we accuse God because things don't go the way we want them to go. And yet why is that? Because man brought all the calamities. On himself. God didn't cause those things. Man, because of his rejection of God, God had given us a prescription for good and we've chosen to reject it, to neglect it, to ignore it. We don't want God. We don't want his rule over us. So we choose our own way. And then when things don't go as we would hope, we blame God as though he's responsible. But we are the ones who chose the path. God is good to all men to all creatures because God inherently, intrinsically, essentially is good. That's all he can be. So think about God's goodness ultimately. What is the ultimate expression of God's goodness? Well, it's that he has made provision for forgiveness of sin and reconciliation to him. Even again, considering what man has done, look what God has done on the other side. So reconciliation with God can only come from God. Man neither desires reconciliation with God on his own, nor is he capable of achieving it. He can't. The only way that man can be reconciled with God is that God is the one who came to man, who brought it about, who set the plan in order, who completed the plan in order that man might be rescued. God is the initiator, and God is the accomplisher of our redemption, our restoration, our reconciliation. Hebrews 12 tells us that he is the author and the perfecter of our faith. He is the one who has done everything because what has man done? Genesis 6, then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now, what is the natural response to that by God? Well, obviously, he destroyed the world, and yet he preserved man through Noah and his family because he was not going to 
destroy man as a whole. He had made a promise all the way back in Genesis 3, and he's going to carry that through. So yes, there was punishment, but the goodness of God still preserved man in spite that their heart was only centered on evil continually. And what about the heart? Jeremiah 17, the heart is more deceitful than all else, and it is desperately sick. Who can understand it? Romans 3, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good, not even one. For all of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment. That's man. That's man. And yet we want to accuse God of not being good. And look what man has created. We are the creators of the world that we live in, not God. A.W. Pink, back in the earlier part of the 20th century, said this, The goodness of God is seen in that when man transgressed the law of his creator, a dispensation of unmixed wrath did not at once commence. That's what should have happened. Unmixed wrath should have been poured out on man because of his sin. And yet, in spite of that, it didn't. He goes on to say, Well might God have deprived his fallen creatures of every blessing, every comfort, every pleasure. Instead, he ushered in a regime of a mixed nature of both mercy and judgment. And even with all the evils which attend our fallen state, the balance of good greatly outweighs the bad. With comparatively rare exceptions, men and women experience a far greater number of days of health than they do of sickness and pain. There is much more creature happiness than creature misery in the world. And even in our sorrows, God has given to the human mind the pliability which adapts itself to circumstances and makes the most of them. God has given us the ability to cope. He has provided a means, even in the midst of our heartache and sorrow and brokenness. All of this is given to us despite the fact that man is the one who brought it all on himself. We created the misery. God is not responsible for the evil. And yet, God's goodness does not vary. God is the fullness of goodness at all times. There's no lesser, there's no greater expressions of God's goodness because he cannot vary in any way. So we see that he's not a shifting shadow. Every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights. He always is good. Even in his judgments, God is good. He is always trying to bring about a better result for people through his judgments. His judgments are the kindnesses of God. He disciplines those that he loves. He's upholding, when he makes judgments, he is upholding that which is good when he judges unrighteousness. If God did not punish wickedness and evil, then he would not be good. The eradication of evil is one of the greatest expressions of God's goodness. God's intolerance of sin is a demonstration of his goodness. He will not allow what is evil, what is contrary to him and to what is right and good and pure. He will not allow it to exist. So the judgment of evil is an expression of God's goodness. Again, listen to what Pink had to say. He said, would God be good if he did not punish those who made wrong use of his blessings, abused his benevolence, and trampled his mercies beneath their feet? It will be no reflection upon God's goodness, but rather the brightest exemplification of it when he shall rid the earth of those who have broken his laws, defied his authority, mocked his messengers, scorned his son, and persecuted those for whom he died. That's God's goodness, to judge, to bring right, to bear upon things, to put things right. That is God's goodness. And he's good when he judges his people, again, for our own sake, that we might be made right before him. 
For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives in order that he might make us like him. What is God's intention for us? That we be made in the likeness of Christ. That's what he is about. Can there be anything greater than to be conformed and made into the likeness and the image of Christ? All of God's dealings with us, even those things that are difficult and seem harsh, it is God's goodness because he knows what his ultimate plan and purpose and objective for us is. His mercy ultimately triumphs over judgment, James 2 tells us. So in the midst of judgment, God has provided for the rescue of those who have even rebelled against him. He has provided rescue. Romans 5 tells us that. It says, for while we were still helpless at the right time, Christ died for whom? For the kind of good, for the pretty good, for the really good, for those who want to be good. He died for the ungodly. There is none good. Everyone he died for is ungodly. Each one of us is ungodly. In spite of that, even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. And not only did he make provision, but let's look at how, the manner in which he made provision for the justification, for the reconciliation, the restitution of man and God. He didn't just declare it because he can't. We've already said God is just. He must judge the guilty. He can't just say, well, okay, forget about it. Y'all go on your way. No, as a just God, he must punish sin. The crime must be paid for. So he couldn't just declare it so. So did he send someone? Well, he did send messengers. But again, the messengers could only tell you what you should do, and you're responsible to do it. Man can't do it. So the messenger wasn't sufficient. He told you what you needed to know, but he didn't tell you how to go about getting it accomplished. He didn't send an angelic being, something that would cause great fear in us and, and cause us maybe to tremble and to bow down. But again, that doesn't make us right because the sin still exists. So how did he go about it? He didn't just send someone that appeared to be like God, like we see in the Old Testament, these theophanies where Jesus or, or the God head of some form came and appeared as a man. But he wasn't really a man. He just appeared. He didn't send Jesus in that way. Galatians 4 tells us how he did it. At just the right time, God sent his son into the world, born of a woman, born in flesh and blood, and born under the law. So Jesus was subject to the law. He could not exceed. He could not uh, live above the law. He was not above the law. He had to submit himself completely to the law and be perfect in God's sight. He had to live an entire lifetime, a full lifetime, not just the last three years. He had to live from birth until death at 33 years of age to fully prove that he could live an absolutely perfect life with all the temptations, everything that could be offered to man. He lived it perfectly for all that time. He lived in, in subjection as well to the human body. He was tired. He was thung, hungry. He was thirsty. He was sad. He cried. He was betrayed. He was a man, fully man. This is the manner in which God showed his goodness. It seemed like it would be so much simpler to do it in another way. And yet he yielded up himself, left heaven, submitted himself to the rule of God's law and to, to the, the, the frailties of man for those 33 years with the exception of one thing. He never sinned. He was perfect in his life. Philippians 2 tells us so clearly about this, he said, although he existed in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. Otherwise, he, other words, he, he had the right, but he refused to accept it. I will not take the rights and use the rights that I have as God. But what did he do? He emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. That's the manner in which God displayed his goodness in the redemption of man. How could it be that God would do this 
for the very ones who rejected him, who created the situation that he is now having to pay for. We sang, when I surveyed the wondrous cross, written by Isaac Watts. Listen to these familiar words from Watts as well. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for such a worm as I? Was it for crimes that I had done that he groaned upon the tree? Oh, amazing pity, grace unknown, and love beyond degree. Well might the sun in darkness hide and shut his glories in when Christ, the mighty maker, died for man, the creature's sin. That's what we contribute to salvation. Look at the manner in which God went about bringing restitution, reconciliation, salvation, forgiveness by pouring it all out on Christ. That we, the guilty, might go free. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Nothing of me. It's only of Christ. So in order to satisfy God's justice, he had to judge sin in the fullest measure. And rather than leave man to suffer the penalty, the eternal wrath of God, Jesus himself, God himself, bore the sins of his people and died a very real death in order that the guilty might go free. But not only do we go free, we're adopted into the family of God. We are children of God. We are co-heirs with Christ. He's gone to that extent. Not just, okay, you're forgiven, now go your way. No, come, come to me. You are my child. You can call me, call me Abba, Father. You have that right. You have that privilege. You are co-heirs with Christ. First John says, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is. We don't know what it's going to be like, but we're going to be like him, fully like Christ. Behold the goodness of God in that. <clears throat> There's no way we can fathom it, but it's something we need to contemplate. Oh, God, your goodness, your mercy, whatever else may be true in life, nothing can compare to having the gift of salvation, to being a child of God, to having an eternity to be with God. So when Moses was wanting to, to, to see God and say, he said, God, do not send us out unless your presence go with us. I can't do it. Don't want, there's no way we can. Lord, you must go with us or I'm not going. So this was Moses' prayer. He said, I pray you show me your glory. He wanted to see more of of who God was. He'd already seen him in the plagues. He'd already seen him with the Red Sea. He'd seen him with the pillar of cloud and fire. And I mean, he'd seen so many amazing, miraculous, powerful demonstrations of who God is. But even now he says, God, we've got a journey to go and I don't know what's ahead. Show me your glory that I might know you, trust you, rely upon you, have the strength to go on. How am I going to keep going with all these people, particularly considering how rebellious these people were? So he said, God, show me your glory. God's answer was, I myself will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show compassion on whom I will show compassion. He showed Moses his goodness. That's what propelled. That's what encouraged. He could trust God, even in the midst of everything that was getting ready to happen and all the unknowns, it was God's goodness he can trust in. Matthew Henry says that God's goodness is his glory and he will have us to know him by the glory of his mercy more than by the glory of his majesty. The greatness, the awesomeness, that, that fearful thing as we see God, it's like he is demonstrating himself more through his mercy, through his goodness, even than what is, is the awesomeness of his being. So his goodness is all around us. We see it in everything. If we'll just take the time to notice and consider from where 
these things came from. And we will especially see it as we look into God's word and see all that he has done for our salvation, for our provision, not only in this life, but in the one to come. His greatest goodness is seen in the Son and what God has done to provide for our redemption. He's fully trustworthy. He is always good. Yet, that goodness, as we've already said, does include the fact that he will not tolerate sin. He won't tolerate evil. Wickedness will be judged because he is absolute purity. Thus, to fulfill all goodness, he must eradicate sin, evil, wickedness. That's why God's goodness is actually a very frightening thing. Some of you may have heard the sermon by Paul Washer, him state this in sermons, but he spoke to a group one day and he said, I want you to think of what's the most terrifying attribute of God. What scares you the most? Is it his justice, his wrath, his majesty, his glory, his, his awesome power? He said, I'll tell you what the most terrifying attribute of God is. Is that God is good. He said there were a few kind of snickers or like, you know, puzzled looks. And he says, because you're not. The sense that God is absolute perfection, absolute goodness should terrify me because I'm not. I cannot please God of my own doing. The only way we can be made right is by God doing something in us and making it right, which is done in Christ. If sin is not dealt with, then the goodness of God, in his goodness, he will judge the sinner. He will cast him into hell, which is the only just and right thing to do, to rid the world of evil. His goodness is the judgment of sin. That's why his goodness is something to be feared because of who he is, but yet because of his goodness, we can have hope because he, out of his goodness, has made a way that we might know him. There must be, therefore, then this appropriate fear of God and his judgment, but yet the hope because of God's goodness and what he has done. Not that he will overlook sin, but that only in Christ we can be freed from the penalty of it because it is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God for our God is a consuming fire. Both of those passages from Hebrews. Christ, then, is the only refuge. That's the only thing we can hope in. He is the ultimate expression of God's goodness. And in Christ, in the body, physical body of Christ, he judged sin. Only in him can we find safety. Only in him can we escape judgment. It's only in Christ. So Romans 11, when Paul says, behold, the kindness and the severity of God all at one time. The judgment on Christ, the severity, the hatred of sin, pouring it all out on Christ. It wasn't the physical death that was so bad. It was, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That was what was so horrible in the crucifixion, was God's rejection, God's judgment, the severity of God against sin. And yet, all of that is still the expression of his goodness and his kindness. So behold, the kindness and the severity of God. We can't just blithely go through life hoping that out of God's goodness he will rescue us. No, it's only found in Christ. A.W. Tozer said, the greatness of God rouses fear within us, but his goodness encourages us not to be afraid of him. So to fear and not be afraid, that is the paradox of faith. There is a rightful fear. There is a recognition of, of God's goodness will demand justice, but his goodness has also provided the means for us to find salvation. So outside of Christ, we have everything to fear. God's goodness will not allow sin to exist without punishment. His goodness demands it. But in Christ, we have nothing to fear regarding judgment because he's provided for us. Romans 8 tells us that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That goodness in Christ, we're free, we're justified. We're not only that, we're adopted. We're children of God. We have an eternity that is secure. So we see God's goodness everywhere. He's good to all men. He's good to all creatures because God simply is good. But he's especially good to his children. 
Psalm 84 says, For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord gives grace and glory. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, how blessed is the man who trusts in you. So even in our trials, our difficulties, our heartaches, our sorrow, the realities that we all go through, God's still good. He can't change that. God is good. And look at what he has done for us. What did he tell Paul? My grace is sufficient for you. I will never leave you, nor will I ever forsake you. He is sufficient. He is good, even in the midst of every type of thing that we go through. And what did he tell us in John 14, speaking of eternity? He said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. That's our ultimate hope, our ultimate joy. The goodness of God will be displayed then forever and ever before us as we live with him. So what should this elicit from us? If we consider these realities, particularly if we are in Christ, it has to cause us to give thanks, to give praise, to give love to him, to give service to him. Think back about what we read in Psalm 107 at least eight times. It says, give thanks, give praise extol God, give sacrifices of thanksgiving. Eight times at least it's reminding us all that God has done, even in his judgments, it's all for our good. That's why we can, can trust Romans 8, 28, that all things God causes them all to work together for good to them who love him and are called according to his purposes. So it just has to do with, am I going to believe what the Bible tells me? Or am I going to let my sentiment, my feeling, my circumstances dictate how I feel? Not to say that we don't struggle with human realities, but can I cling to the reality that this is true? God is sufficient. He will provide. The last verse again of that Psalm 107 says this, Who is wise? Let him give heed to these things and consider, consider the loving kindnesses of the Lord. So do I recognize God's goodness? Do I thank him for his goodness? Arthur Pink again, gratitude is the return justly required from the objects of his goodness. Gratitude should come from the objects of his goodness. That's us. Yet it is often withheld from our great benefactor simply because his goodness is so constant and so abundant it is lightly esteemed because it's exercised toward us in the common course of events. It is not felt because we daily experience it. The goodness of God is everywhere around us. And yet, how do we respond? How do we look to God? Do we praise? Do we thank him? Do we look at what he has given rather than what he hasn't? Do we see God's goodness around us? It's easy to take his goodness for granted. Or we can complain because things don't go our way. But again, the psalmist said, consider, consider the loving kindnesses of the Lord. Psalm 106 says, praise the Lord. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Why? For he is good. For his loving kindness is everlasting. Oh, taste and see, taste and see that the Lord is good. How blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Nahum, seven, Nahum, Nahum 1, the Lord is good. He's a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knows those who take refuge in him. God knows us if we take refuge in him, if we trust him. For the Lord is good, his loving kindness is everlasting, and his faithfulness to all generations. Therefore, because of the goodness of God and that it endures forever, we ought never to be discouraged. We can always hope in the Lord because he is good. We finish with what Peter said in God's provision in his second letter. He said, grace and peace be multiplied to you. How? In the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him 
who called us by his own glory and excellence, for by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. Partakers of the divine nature. He's made it possible through the knowledge, through the understanding of God, the seeking of God, who called us to himself, and he's granted us these precious and magnificent promises that we might know him and participate, share in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. The goodness of God. We just need to consider it, to think about it, to, to recognize and to call upon God in all things, and, and, but knowing that, that God is good. It may not feel that way. It may not look that way as far as our physical, you know, our, 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 our circumstances. But that doesn't take away from God's goodness. He's good. And if we just trust that, we look to him, we hope in him, we cry out to him, knowing his nature, his person, he is faithful. And he will do good to those who seek refuge in him. Praise God that hope, that mercy, that command that he has given. Well, Lord, help us because the flesh is willing often, but it's weak, and sometimes it's not even willing. So help us. Help us to see the truth. Oh, Lord, testify to yourself, please, through your word, through whatever other means. Lord, give us eyes to see, ears to hear, hearts to receive. And as the psalmist commanded us, taste. Well, the only way we can taste something is if we put it in our mouth. We can't taste you if we don't take a bite of that, if we don't put it in our mouth. So help us, Lord, not to be negligent, but to, to seek after you, to, to trust you, to try you, and to prove you, saith the Lord of hosts, to see if I will not pour out a blessing. Lord, help us in the weakness of the flesh, in the frailty of the flesh. Lord, don't let us succumb to it, but to have eyes of faith, that hope in you, trusting in who you really are, ultimately who you really are, and to believe these things and to live on these things, that they might have power in our lives, as, say, as Peter said, that the, the, these precious promises, that the power of God, and that we would be a testimony, we would be a light, we would be salt to the world around us, would give us grace. We can't do it on our own. And don't let us take any of the credit or pride in anything that you do, but to know anything that you do in us is solely of you. But Lord, what an amazing thing to be able to witness the work of God in me, in me. Lord, help us not to, to see it from a historical or a, a biblical point of view of what happened then and there and other people, but Lord, to believe it can be mine, that these things are true to every believer, to every child of God. Lord, show us these things, open our eyes, don't let us live in complacency or dishonor of you in any way by, by having doubt. Lord, help us to live in faith. But that only comes from you as we seek you, the true knowledge of you, your promises to grant it. We praise you for that and the hope that we have because of who you are in your goodness. In your name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen.